Hello, and welcome to episode 99 of the Sci-Fi Podcast. From Scottsdale, Arizona, I'm Nick Zaltra. On today's podcast, I am pleased to welcome Dr. Katie Plassance, a professor specializing in philosophy of science and interdisciplinary collaboration in the Department of Knowledge Integration at the University of Waterloo. Katie's research focuses on ways to increase engagement between those in her own discipline, philosophy of science, and the rest of the world, including scientists, policymakers, and diverse publics. In short, Katie wants to help philosophers use their skills to make the world a better place. Her work aims to improve our understanding of the nature of scientific knowledge, foster fruitful interactions between philosophy and STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math, and help make scientific research and its applications more epistemically and ethically sound. Now, to accomplish these goals, Katie regularly collaborates with students and faculty from a variety of disciplines, such as philosophy, sociology, psychology, and engineering. Through her early work in the human behavioral sciences, Katie noticed significant missed opportunities for philosophers of science to impact scientific practice. She began to analyze the goals and approaches of philosophy of science and built a collaborative network of philosophers in the process, the Consortium for Socially Relevant Philosophy of and in Science and Engineering, or SR Poise. Katie has taken both philosophical as well as empirical approaches to studying how socially and scientifically engaged philosophy of science works, including creating a theoretical framework for modeling interactional expertise between philosophers of science and scientists. Now, in her current work, Katie is conducting a five-year SHRC-funded research project, Engaging Science with Philosophy, Best Practices for Fostering Effective Collaboration, which examines scientists' and engineers' attitudes towards and experiences with philosophy and philosophers of science. And thus, without further ado, let's bring in Katie. Dr. Katie Plaisance, welcome to the Sci-Fi Podcast. How are you this Monday morning? Thanks, Nick. I'm doing great. How are you doing? I'm doing very well. Or should I say, full professor, Katie Plaisance. Congratulations. (laughs) Thank you. Uh, Yeah. How has that been making the, uh, make, with the promotion and everything? How did, how, how has it been going? Good. Good. It's nice. It's nice to have that recognition from one's peers. So yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. And, and how has your summer been up in Waterloo? Good. I'm actually back in Minnesota right now, uh, visiting oh. family. Yeah. Oh. So I'm originally from Minneapolis and I'm back here for the Minnesota State Fair, the great get together. Oh, fun. The Minnesota State Fair. What, what is that like? Oh, it's amazing. Uh, <laughs> I think it's, I don't know if it's the, the biggest state fair in the country, but it's pretty, uh, it's pretty full on. It's, yeah. you know, I don't know, thousands of people getting together and, and eating a really amazing food that's horrible for you. I love it. The Midwest is known for that, but it's also known yes. for some of the best summers in, uh, I would say, in the United States. I've said I've had a couple of Chicago summers, and uh, you know, having studied in Indiana, I could say I'm I'm very happy when I've been in the Midwest for the most part. So, and Minnesota, yeah, especially. me too, me too. Oh, that's wonderful. Uh, well, that's great. Uh, so, visiting family, have you been doing anything else in terms of uh, your summertime? Uh, some additional research, some teaching. Yeah, so I'm not teaching this summer, but I have been doing quite a bit of research. I'm sure we'll be talking about later, but I have a um, a major grant project where I'm Ooh. studying collaborations between philosophers of science and scientists and engineers. And I've been writing up all of our data from interviews with uh, scientists and engineers who have collaborated with philosophers, as well as a large-scale survey that my colleagues and I recently did with about, uh, I think, a little over 2,000 scientists and engineers across Canada and the U.S. Wow. So, so where, where, I is, where I am in some ways, like interviewing philosophers of science, kind of asking about a little bit about how they've gone about collaborating, you've gone on to do some full-fledged study and research into the sort of the real nitty-gritty understanding how these collaborations actually take place. Exactly. And understanding sort of what motivates people to engage in these collaborations, how they get started, um, what they do to maintain them, what are the challenges they face, 
And really, what are the um, key benefits that both philosophers of science and the scientists and engineers experience as a result of working together? Wow. Well, I look forward to you know seeing some of those interviews and episodes when they've come to be. What is the sort of the sort of the goal in terms of once you've gotten these interviews together, do you hope to publish some uh, findings about them, release them online? Yeah, absolutely. Unfortunately, we can't release the interviews online due to um, the the sort of agreement with our um, right. institutional review board or ethics board. Um, so they're confidential, which the upside of that is that people are wearing, willing to share a lot of information they might not be if it was going to be released online. Yes, yes. Um, so that's really helpful, actually, because we can really understand what are some of the challenges that people have faced, uh, especially when it comes to maybe negative attitudes from their colleagues or ways mm. in which their work hasn't been properly recognized. Um, but so what we're doing is, so I've actually previously interviewed several philosophers of science who do more broadly engaged work. Um, that we've written up, uh, I think published in 2021. Uh, I want to say the title is Pathways of Influence. Um, and really looking at sort of how, what are the impacts of philosophy of science and scientific domains, both science and policy. Um, and so in that, in that paper, we, did a qualitative analysis, as a lot of sociologists and other uh, social scientists do, of the interviews to identify some of the questions I was asking about, or I was uh, some of the issues I was outlining before. And then more recently, we decided to look at the other side of that and interview scientists and engineers. And so we're doing a qualitative analysis of those. We've got the first two manuscripts pretty much ready to go. Um, nice. And then we're going to be hitting the pause button on that while we start to write up some of the survey findings. Um, quite a lot of data. So we're going to be publishing several manuscripts from these these two related projects. Well, as someone who's spoken to with philosophers of science quite a bit, I really want to know what do the scientists think? Like, what did they find? Have What have they found useful? What have they found challenging in regard? Like, I've had a little bit of experience. I, I did have like some brief time uh, serving as an embedded ethicist back in the day in a, uh, oh, actually nice. a neuroprosthetics lab with bioengineers. So they were doing these like psychophysics experiments where they were studying uh, tactile perceptions in humans and macaque monkeys to ultimately basically create the, like prosthetic limbs um but we had physics or excuse me um they were so we had uh, ethicists kind of working in to sort of make the the lab more ethically sound but i did get to, to hear some of the sort of uh, in the lab meetings what it was like kind of working with them and what it's also like working with philosophers so i'd love to hear more about that <laughs> in terms of and it sounds like uh, yeah your papers will document some really interesting things yeah, absolutely. And that's a really cool experience. It was uh, maybe fun. we should talk about that. Oh, yeah. We'll, <laughs> we'll, we'll talk about that about. another time. Uh, yeah, I might it, have to interview you. <laughs> it was in my master's program. It was really fun. I wish it was It was in a bioethics program. And so it's it was super fascinating uh, doing like, yeah, yeah. We'll, t- we'll talk about it in uh, another time for sure. But but I'm really interested to hear because I remember we, we actually met, I think for the first time it was like, if I can recall, the 2018 Philosophy of Science Association meeting. And I think I was presenting a... If I can recall, I was presenting a poster and I think you were too. And you're like, Hey, I do this kind of, I, I, I've been doing this stuff. Like I've been like really interviewing people. And like, I was like, Oh, this is so cool. Like we do similar kinds of things with being thinking about philosophers or, uh, reflecting on and sort of, uh, interviewing and engaging with philosophers of science. I didn't know what I was doing. I think you had a more structured position in terms of approaching it. But, uh, so it's really good to finally like get to connect and, and, uh, to hear more about your work. But. Before we launch into it, let's take a step back and learn a little bit more about uh, you and your background and what led you to this uh, line of work. So tell us, Katie, where did you grow up? Yeah, so I grew up in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Um, And I was always, I know you usually ask folks about kind of what their interests were, so I'll I'll tell you a little bit about that. I'd love to learn, Um, yeah. I I always had lots of interests, so um, I, you know did um played lots of sports when i was a kid softball uh, did gymnastics also was really into chess and the debate team oh nice um i was in girl scouts until i was 18 um so, Whoa. yeah very very involved in lots of different things as i still am today um but i was always really an inquisitive kid to you know asking lots of questions annoying my parents asking them why all of the time as i'm sure you know many <laughs> children do but maybe a little bit more extreme. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, so, and Minneapolis is a great place to grow up. There's really lots to do here. It's wonderful to be in a city with, um, you know, lots of different activities, but also for those who haven't been in Minneapolis, there's a lot of nature here too. There's a lot of, um, you know, hiking trails and lakes in the city. So it's a really great place to grow up and be, you know, an active and meet lots of different people. Wonderful. So it sounds like you had those sort of uh, lots of activities and lots of interest growing up, but also had those burning questions of why and why do things work the way they do and how do they work? So uh, did those carry in in, in terms of, um, I guess, thinking about what you wanted to be when you grew up? <laughs> yeah, yeah, they did actually. Only I was actually, when I was younger, coming at it more from science. I was always a very... Ah, okay science and math kid, right? I Like, I hated the humanities. <laughs> like, who would want to do that? Um, <laughs> like, who would want to so just write always, and read all the time? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, who wants to do that? Um, so, yeah, I was always really interested in science and math. I especially loved biology, but I was really fascinated by humans and our place in the world and understanding the natural world. So, yeah. when I was a young kid, I remember telling my parents, I don't know how old I was, but definitely quite young, when I told my parents I wanted to be an astrophysicist when I grew up. They're oh, like, so sounds cool. good. You're like seven years old. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I would read a lot of stuff about astronomy and biology. Oh. Um, you know, went to lots of museums when I was a kid. It was very nerdy in that respect. Um, but I also, you know, when I was a teenager and I was fascinated more with these questions of, um, you know, of humans place in the world, I started, and I don't even remember how this, how this, um, originated, but I started getting really interested in Eastern philosophy and Buddhist literature. So oh. reading work by uh, authors like Thich Nhat Hanh, um, and that really resonated with me. And I guess I always just was doing that kind of on the side and never really thought that's something you could study or do more formally in school. So while I was really interested in science and math in school, um, my my other interests in really the humanities and these more philosophical questions were things I was just really reading and thinking about in my free time. Nice, nice. So, how did they? So, in terms of your interest in science, like, what did you do to go forward and attempt to, you know, create a career in that? So, what were some of your next steps? Yeah. So, I'll start back actually in high school um, because one of the one of the sort of bridges for me to philosophy, how I eventually got there from science, was that I was in a program called International Baccalaureate or IB, oh. and the International Baccalaureate program, which is um, really throughout uh, throughout the globe. Um, the International Baccalaureate Program has this course that students take in their junior and senior year of high school called the Theory of Knowledge. Mm. And it turned out, I found out later on when I was in graduate school, that one of the epistemology professors at the University of Minnesota actually helped design our course. So the Theory of Knowledge course I took was absolutely fantastic, top notch. Um, and we were asking questions like, you know, what is the nature of scientific knowledge? How does it differ, differ from knowledge in math or from other disciplines? Um, you know, are values and facts separate? Are they intertwined? So, you know, it turns out actually a lot of it was in line with philosophy of science. I just didn't know that that was what that was. Mm -hmm. And so I found it absolutely fascinating. And in for students who are doing a full IB diploma, you have to do what's called an extended essay. Um, I don't remember how long it was, 20, 30 pages. It may have been less than that, but as a kid, it's whatever. It seemed incredibly long. And so it was this project you would do over several months. And I was interested in my senior year of, you know, of uh, high school. I was really interested in human genetics, but, you know, it being, I think, what, 1995, 96 at the time, we didn't really have the lab equipment for me to do a genetic study that I could mm -hmm. use for my extended essay. So what I did was is that I took these theories, these ethics theories that I had been learning as part of my um, debate work. So I was doing Lincoln-Douglas style debate at the time, which is sometimes referred to as values debate. And to do Lincoln-Douglas style debate, you have to read John Stuart Mill and Immanuel Kant and other philosophers to understand these ethical theories. And I thought that was really fascinating. So what I decided to do for my extended essay was to take these ethical theories and use them as a lens to um, investigate, or not investigate, but to reflect on the ethical implications of various um, potential technologies in human genetics. So for my theory of knowledge essay, I was looking at um, ethical issues in genetic technologies and thinking about things like stem cells and cloning as well. So, you know, 
again, I didn't really understand that philosophy of science was a valid area that you could go into. Yeah. And I was just really doing this as an, as with the, the work that I was reading in, in Buddhism on the side. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. And that translated when I went to university because I originally was planning to do um, biochemistry following in my uncle's footsteps, who was a biochemist. Oh. Um, and so I, yeah. And so I, I ended up, um, well, I switched. I declared my major as molecular biology because at where I went to school at the University of Wisconsin Madison, if you did biochemistry, you had to take physical chemistry or PCHEM, mm-hmm. which I heard was the hardest class at the entire university. <laughs> <laughs> so so I, I thought, okay, this is challenging enough. I'll switch to molecular biology. Yeah. And a lot of a lot of the molecular biology classes were focused on human genetics. So I decided to do that as my major, but because I was studying in the states where the liberal arts degree was, um, you know, pretty pervasive, we had to take these pesky humanities courses. Uh, and so yeah. I started taking philosophy courses, you know, thinking, oh, maybe this will be like the debate team yeah, experience or their debate knowledge. and philosophy are very connected, obviously. Exactly. So like, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that's how. So I ended up. I ended up, you know taking some philosophy classes and really enjoying them and, and declaring a, a double major. So I did both molecular biology and philosophy oh, um, wow. for my undergraduate degrees. Um, and then I can talk more about sort of how that transformed, but that's that's kind of where I got started in university. Well, what I'm impressed, first of all, this, even in a secondary school, coming to weave these ideas together, like that's just so impressive. I know I know, from my, my own personal <laughs> experience of just like, it was just like, all right, I needed to learn chemistry. I needed to learn biology. And like you already at a very early age have just, were just thinking about, you know, kind of a bigger picture, like how to sort of connect these different disciplines together or how to do some interesting work or perhaps even so like how to do what you wanted to do in some way. It's like, I yes. want to do, you know, <laughs> and I think that's what a lot of us philosophers of science realize is like you're presented with something. You're like, I don't really want to do that. But if I could do a little of this and a little of that. That's a lot of you exactly know, that excites exactly. me and stimulates me. And I think those who are the most successful that I've noticed, I mean, that can figure out how to do those and how to sort of be sort of appropriate or connect these kinds of things. So, OK, so you you manage, though, to take it. So to weave together, uh, do a double major in both uh, the sciences as well as um, as, as the humanities, essentially. Uh, but yeah. so, yeah. So in terms of then. I mean, was the plan still to study these things, but still to be like to to go into the sciences or like what? uh, Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, My plan was to do a PhD in human genetics. So um, and that's something I I knew I wanted to do a PhD in science, uh, in biology, some biological field ever since I was a kid. Um, Again, following in my uncle's footsteps, he had a PhD in biochemistry. Um, So I. That was my plan was to do a PhD after undergrad. Um, but what happened was in my third year, so there's, there's two sort of, um, formative courses I took that changed my trajectory. So in my third year, I took a bioethics course and it was so cool how they designed this course. It was co-taught by a philosopher, Dan Wickler, mm-hmm. a physician, Norman Faust, and mm-hmm. a bioethicist slash law professor, Al Dicharo. Oh, perfect. Um, and it was amazing. And this was at, back in 1998. And so not only was this so great to have law and medicine and philosophy working together um, in this course, but I took the course in 1998 when Jamie Thompson um, had just isolated embryonic stem cells. Mm. And it turns out that the three professors teaching the class were able to get him to come and speak with us days after the announcement. Oh, wow. um, that he had that he demonstrated it was fascinating we had in our class schedule we had this one week it said to be determined and we all just thought okay they haven't figured out what they're doing yet it turns out they had already booked him and they just couldn't tell anyone until the um i think it was the article in science came out so he came and spoke to us as did el Tacharo. and what was fascinating was we learned that um el Tacharo and jamie thompson had been tra- they were going to be traveling together across the country to give talks where Jamie Thompson would introduce the science and El Tacharo would talk about the ethical issues and the legal implications. And I just immediately thought how cool that they're doing this together, which is probably one of the reasons why I've always been interested in collaboration, as we'll talk yeah. about later. Um, but it was fascinating. And so um, so, so in that class, I loved that class. Um, but in it, when we were doing the discussions with the students, I got a little frustrated, actually, because when we would discuss particular issues like stem cells and cloning and surrogacy. Um, some of the students in the class were 
focused more in philosophy or humanities and didn't have a strong science background and would take positions that I thought were odd because to me, they seemed to misunderstood, understand how the science works. Mm. So I really started to develop strong feelings that people who are engaging with those issues needed a strong science background so that you're really doing the ethics of science and not what I would say is the ethics of science fiction. Um, so paired with that, not long after I took that course, I took a philosophy biology course with Elliot Sober. And my experience there was quite different because um, Elliot would actually um, recruit students or maybe they just happened to come to his class that were in the biological sciences. Um, and even my, my teaching assistant, my graduate teaching assistant from one of my biology classes was in that class as well. Um, and so we got really into the nitty gritty of the science. And that to me was exciting. Um, and it really felt we, like we were digging into, you know, the richness of these, the sort of the integration of the philosophical and scientific issues. And so what happened was is that also my senior year, I was working in a lab. And while I was in the lab every day, I would annoy all of the people in the lab with my questions <laughs> of like, you know, okay, we just ran this gel and, you know, got these results. How do we actually know that we can trust this result? Um, yep. You know, what... What is, what are the standards of evidence in this area of science? How do, how does the studying the protein pathways in, in apoptosis and the eye of a mouse, which is what we were doing in this lab, translate to macular degeneration treatments? And people, the response I got was shut up and run your gel. Um, yeah. and there was, but there was one PhD student who would humor me and we'd have <laughs> these conversations. Um, and it was fascinating. And I realized I didn't actually love doing the lab work. Um, Obviously, that's very important work, but that's not really what I enjoy doing. I liked asking bigger questions about the nature of scientific knowledge. And so that's when I realized, you know, between, you know, and then having exposure to, to Elliot Sober's class and realizing that philosophy of science exists and is a thing, I realized I needed to switch gears. Um, so I went to some folks, um, some different professors and asked for their advice about switching gears. And I will say, I'm not going to name names, but I will say that one person I spoke with said, look, you know, if you're interested in, well, I was really talking about bioethics at the time. If I'm interested in bioethics, there's three routes you can take. You can do a PhD in philosophy. You can do a, an MD or you can do a JD. And with my background, I could have done medical school or law school, no problem. Um, and so I actually started to study for both the LSAT and the MCAT. I guess actually then later on the GRE. And I really thought about what do I want to do here? Do I want to do med school, law school, or philosophy, graduate yeah, school? I get it. And, and the person who gave me this advice said, you know, all three of these are, are great options except the PhD in philosophy. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's kind of true. They, <laughs> it's partly right. Said, yeah. I mean, what they said was, um, you know, you'll have, you'll get more respect and you'll have an easier time with careers when it came to medical school, law school. And I think that might be true on the career side. Sure. Um, and so I spent all this time, you know, studying for the MCATs and the LSATs and, and really thinking it through. And then one day I started thinking about what would my life like be like after I finished these degrees. Yeah. And it just didn't seem really appealing to me. And I realized I'd only be doing this further study as a means to an end. I wouldn't enjoy it as an end in itself. And so, whereas that, that didn't, that didn't feel the same for me with a PhD in philosophy. So I decided to against their advice, which has become a theme of my entire career is basically <laughs> ignore, ignoring the advice I get from, uh, from senior professors. Um, I, I ignored their advice and d decided to do, pursue a PhD in philosophy. So I took a year off to travel um, and go live in California and get some sunshine. Nice. <laughs> before coming nice. back to the Midwest. Nice. Um, but yeah, so I ended up going on to do a, a PhD in philosophy after that. Well, wonderful. Thank you for that. That is an excellent story. And I, I appreciate you sharing a little bit about that. I can relate uh, uh, quite a bit. And I'm sure some of our listeners can relate too, especially in terms of under figuring out what do I want to do and having some of these different professional options. And I think you provide a compelling case for, well, when, when listening to what you, what you want to do, you know, and what you think would be Go, what would you think would satisfy you the most or be the most appealing in sort of the long run? So, uh, so what did, uh, in terms of turning your, uh, switching gears essentially and turning your focus toward a professional career in philosophy, uh, what did that mean in terms of, uh, how you approach the discipline, um, or how you approached your work? So by doing the PhD in philosophy, what did that mean you had to do or how, do, uh, 
yeah, how, how did anything change as a result of how you how you then started to approach things? Yeah, well, I'll just say a little bit about my experience in graduate school. I think sure. when I started the PhD, I actually wasn't thinking a lot about. I mean, I guess I was thinking I wanted to do professional bioethics, whatever form that took. Right. But I wasn't thinking a lot about the career afterwards. I just thought it would be really fun to do the PhD in philosophy. Yeah, that's fair. You know, yeah, which actually yeah. was nice because it, it felt a, it felt a little bit um, it felt a little lower stakes to be honest in terms sure. of you know, that th- this this would open up some doors for me. But I knew with my degree in molecular biology, I had other, th- other things to fall back on. Uh, so, right, right. right. I mean, I could go work um, in industry, yep. uh, making, you know, making good money and doing sure. scientific research. So um, so that made it a little bit easier for me just to, to study it for its own sake and then just see where things led, which I guess is very unlike me. I like to plan everything out. But for some reason, for some reason, I just decided to go with the flow when I was starting my PhD. I love that. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> yeah. when, yeah, so when I started graduate schools, I mentioned I was really primarily interested in bioethics. So I, I applied to lots of schools and I landed on the University of Minnesota. I mean, as I mentioned, I'm from there, so it was nice to come back and be near family. But the reason I chose it is because they have a really, the um, yeah, the Center for Bioethics, a really robust, um, very reputable Center for Bioethics. So I originally went there to work with folks like Jeff Kahn and Deb DeBruin and Carl Elliott, of course. Um, but during my visit for orientation, I met Ken Waters. Mm. And in our first meeting, he said, you don't really want to do bioethics. You want to do philosophy of science. <laughs> um and I thought, no, no, I want to do bioethics. So I spent I spent a year taking bioethics classes. But then in my second year, I got into philosophy of science. I took a class with him um, and quickly realized he was right. Um, so during my second year, I took this philosophy of genetics course with, with Ken. Mm-hmm. And it was co-taught with Evelyn Fox Keller, who has had a visiting position at the University of Minnesota when I was there. And so as part of our class, we did a field trip to... Um, uh, I think it was, a, 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 it may have been a Gustavus Adolphus, one of the universities in um, southern Minnesota, runs the Nobel Conference every year. And the theme that year was the nature of nurture. And it was all researchers who study behavioral genetics and developmental psychology um, and other fields around human behavior. Um, so Robert Plowman, who's a behavioral geneticist, was there speaking. Eleanor McAbee, who's a famous developmental psychologist, child psychologist, was there speaking. Um, F. Shalom Caspi, um, and I think it's Barbara Buffett, can't remember her first name, uh, uh, Caspi and Buffett, um, who studied gene environment interactions were there. And it was really fascinating to me because I listened to these folks talk with each other, you know, give talks and, um, and respond to each other over two days. And what was really fascinating to me was not actually, although I'm interested in genetics, it wasn't so much how they were talking about genetics that interested me. It was how they were talking about the environment. Mm. And so they would use this concept called the shared environment or the non-shared environment. And I would listen to them and I thought, okay, well, when Robert Plowman, behavioral geneticist, talks about it, he says that he talks about it in one way. Well, when Eleanor McAbee, who's a developmental psychologist, talks about it, she talks about it in another way. And I got really confused, and I went to Ken Waters, and I said, you know, I'm having trouble understanding these concepts. Can you explain them? And he said, well, maybe the reason you're having under- you think you're having trouble understanding them is that these scientists don't mean the same thing when they use them. <laughs> um, and, of course, Ken Waters is famous for doing work on the gene concept and really looking at how scientists mean different things when they're talking about, about genes. And so I ended up uh, investigating this for that for my paper for that class, and then for my dissertation, decided to dig into it further and really look into the concepts of shared and non-shared environment alongside heritability, which had been studied quite a bit by philosophers of science where shared and non-shared environment hadn't been. Um, and so that was cool because it, it allowed me to really integrate my passion for human genetics, um, psychology, and philosophy of science. And what was fascinating, and this is, and this was really key to my current, where I am in my career now, was, you know, Ken Waters was adamant that if you're going to do this, you need to talk to the scientists. Um, so at the University of Minnesota, the philosopher of science took really seriously the importance of understanding science and science practice and talking to scientists. So when I was there, I was working not only with Ken, but later on with Helen Longino and Ron Geary. So it was really a trifecta um, of, oh my gosh. of supervisors. <laughs> yeah, it was That's an incredible. amazing time to be at the University of Minnesota. Yeah. Um, so I spent so much time 
um, basically across the river talking to the psychologist and hanging out with behavioral geneticists like Matt McGue um, and um, Tom Bouchard. And Tom Bouchard is famous for having pioneered the twin studies at the University of Minnesota in this, I think, set late 70s, early 80s. And so I interviewed these scientists and then sat in on their classes and just found it fascinating how they talked about things. And it seemed like they kept saying different things using the same concept. Um, and so I eventually got invited. They invited me to sit in on their advanced seminar in behavioral genetics that included the professors, um, so uh, Matt and Tom, and then um, Irving Gottesman, who has done a lot of work on schizophrenia. He was in that group and a number of graduate students studying behavioral genetics. And I spent about two years going to this advanced reading group and just listening to these, well, at the first, just listening to these scientists talk to one another and taking notes and trying to understand um, how they saw things um, and what their interests were and what their values were. But then eventually, you know, especially after I'd been there for a few months, the scientists would start asking me questions and then to the point where I was really a real full interlocutor in that group. Um, and as, what, you know, what would they ask about, you? What, what would they? What oh, kind yeah. of questions? Yeah. Um, so, for example, um, I'm trying to think of specific things they asked me. Uh, well, I'll tell you one thing, which was or general um, thoughts. Or, got yeah. Us, yeah, got us into a conversation. Was we were looking at um, something where, and I can't remember exactly what we were looking at, but we were, found an example of where some other re- other researchers or journalists had misunderstood had misunderstood or misconstrued the behavioral genetics research. Um, and one of the, one of the graduate students um, at another point, basically, you know, I, I raised a question, I think about their responsibilities um, to communicate this work. And one of the, one of the behavioral genetics graduate students said, you know, look, I'm just a scientist. Let society do with the science what it will. That's not my job. And so I went back and so I raised with him. I said, well, here's a question for you. You know, a couple of weeks ago, we were looking at, ways the science had been misinterpreted. And a lot of you express frustration mm-hmm. with how the science often gets misinterpreted and that you think people don't really understand the science, even scientists in adjacent fields. So I said, I, you know, can you explain how you can simultaneously hold a position of saying that other people don't have the expertise to understand the science and apply and interpret it correctly, while at the same time saying that it is not your obligation to communicate those findings. And it, it just it just opened up this <laughs> wonderful <laughs> debate. Um, and and people were actually really um, had very different views. And so I kind of just sat back and listened. Um, and then after that, that was sort of the first time that this, you know, really kind of inserted myself. They would ask me questions, you know, about when something came up, you know, oh, well, what do you think about these other researchers' interpretation, do you think that's fair, right? Um, mm-hmm. You know, or, or when we're talking about, can we draw causal conclusions from our research? Do you think that that's actually valid mm-hmm. or warranted, right, that you study this? So that was really lovely. And I have to say, my experience was very positive. Um, and it's not what I was expecting because so many philosophers of science were saying, you know, the scientists don't want to engage with us, but yeah. they were hungry for it. And... It turns out I found out later one of the reasons why was that Paul Meal, who is a very famous and very highly respected psychologist, um, but who had recently passed away, unfortunately, he had been in the psychology department at the University of Minnesota, but he also helped co-found the Center for Philosophy of Science at Minnesota, yeah, yeah. which is the, the oldest of its kind in, in North America. Um, his undergraduate degrees were in philosophy and psychology. And so when his psychology colleagues would ask him, you know, wow, Paul, you are just so brilliant at, at thinking about our methodology and, and identifying these assumptions underlying them and, you know, questioning whether or not we're actually able to draw the inferences we think we are. How do you do that? He said it was my philosophy training. So when I showed up, you know, th- there was um, people were very, very welcoming. Um, and I found that really generally um, in terms of my experience working with scientists. So which I think might be partly locked. Um, but definitely the fact that I happen to be at a place with this history. Wow. <laughs> so, so many, so you, you mentioned a lot of names and for those who probably didn't catch a lot, there's a lot of the folks that Katie mentioned, tons of big time philosophers of science, big time scientists. Uh, so all in the same place. So not only is right, the, uh, Minnesota is not only known for bioethics, but also for philosophy of science as well. Right. With the, yeah, absolutely. I, yeah, yeah. So, and, uh, from what I've heard, there's a big, uh, 
uh, or from speaking with uh, Alan Love recently, there is a big sort of uh, historical kind of reflection on the disciplines coming up. So, uh, yeah, so it's just like that's such a wonderful experience to get to have those those opportunities to kind of piece together things and to already get to be working with scientists. So in terms of, um, you know, certain next steps like so. What, yeah, so what came next? What, what was the uh, sort of further moving yeah. forward? Like, I know you started, you said you started the PhD in, in many ways because you're like, well, this is going to be fun. Like, or because the thought is like, let's lead with our, you know, lead with our interests. And it feels like this is like uh, something to meaningful to do, but it's not like, oh, this is what I'm, you know, this is my career and this, uh, but it's obviously that has changed and you're a working philosopher. So yeah, so what, 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 what were some of your next steps? Yeah, so um, once I'd spent a couple years in graduate school and, and had a better understanding of the academic career path, I thought that would be really interesting. So while my heart wasn't absolutely set on it, if it didn't work out, it didn't work out. I, I really wanted to pursue that that opportunity. Um, <clears throat> and I remember I I had a conversation one day with Ron Geary, and he asked me, you know, he said, have you thought about what you want to do when you finish your PhD? knowing that, you know, you're really your main options are go to a, a research university, an intensive research university, an R1, where you're going to have lots of resources to do research and, you know, lots of scientists and engineers and others that you can collaborate with. But, you know, people aren't going to care as much about your teaching. Or you could go to a liberal arts college, you know, somewhere like um, say St. Olaf or Carleton College, um, where you're going to have smaller class sizes, right. highly engaged students, um, but the resources, you know, for, and research opportunities won't be the same. Um, and I said, well, you know, Ron, I've been thinking about this. I think what I want to do is finish my PhD, um, get a postdoc in philosophy of science in another country to get a non-American perspective on things. Um, and then I would like to find a tenure track position in a, you know, small interdisciplinary program where, I've got, you know, really engaged students in smaller classes where I can teach philosophy and philosophy science, but maybe not just to philosophers, um, and where I can be embedded in a large research university with all those opportunities. And Ron looked at me, and he threw his head back, and he laughed. And then he just shook his head, and he said, that doesn't exist. Um, and Aww. what's funny, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, when I said, well, you know, I, We'll yeah. see. You know, we'll yeah. see, Ron. Yeah, we'll see sure. what happens. What's hilarious is years later, I, I, ran, I ran into him. And he said, you know, I can't believe it. You made it happen. You did exactly <laughs> what you said you're going to do. Because yep. I went on after graduate school and I did a postdoc in Germany um, at the Center for the Philosophy and Ethics of Science um, at um, in Hanover, at Leibniz University in Hanover. Oh, yeah. With yeah. Paul, yeah, with Paul Hoynigan. And I worked with um, Thomas Reid in there as well and, and some of the other philosophers. So I had my opportunity to do the postdoc. And then, as I'll talk about later, I went on. I'm now actually employed at um, University of Waterloo in a small interdisciplinary program <laughs> yeah. embedded in a large research university. L- um, let- oh, go ahead. So, yeah, well, we'll, I know we'll get to that. <laughs> well, no, I guess um, but I was curious about, well, if you have something else. I, otherwise, I would love to know about the, yes, the, the, oh, yeah. the department with which we're in. The department. Which, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'll tell you about that. I'll just say one last thing about the, the postdoc and how I get to oh, where yeah. I am now. Right. Yeah, because yeah, yeah, yeah. you asked about sort of what was next. So my experience in grad school, one of the things I found frustrating was that when I would talk to other philosophers of science about the work I was doing, you know, some of them actually thought that I was spending too much time with the scientists. And they said, mm. you know, you shouldn't spend so much time with the scientists. You're going to lose your critical distance. And that always struck me as odd because oh. I thought, you know, I can still be a critical thinker, even while I'm talking to scientists, but also as philosophers of science, isn't one of our goals to actually influence the science? And if that's our goal, shouldn't we talk to the scientists to A, make sure we understand the science and B, be able to, you know, uh, share our perspectives and views with the scientists to have a direct influence? Um, so that's always the way I thought about it. And I found it really odd that there was such a um, sort of siloing effect that I was seeing between philosophy of science and science. Um, more generally. And so, you know, when people would say this, I thought, um, no, I'm, I'm spending time with the scientists for, for these, you know, these reasons. I want to understand it and I want to be able to contribute. Um, and so when I started my postdoc, what I did was I, um, decided to, uh, come up with a, to put together a conference. Um, so, and I'd already done a couple of conferences when I was in graduate school. 
I'm a hardcore extrovert, so I like to bring people together and, and network and talk about nice. our research. I feel like I'm a misfit in philosophy. Yeah. Um, so I, so I put together this conference with some other folks, um, really thinking about how philosophy of science can be more engaged called making philosophy of science more socially relevant. Mm. And it was really about, you know, engaging with social issues, but also collaborating with scientists and engineers. And I did that with a number of folks. So Sophia Fstio and I organized it. And then Nancy Cartwright, uh, Helen Longino, and Carla Fair organized it with us. And then Carla Fair and I ended up um, getting invited to edit a special issue of Synthesa on the same topic on uh, socially relevant philosophy of science. And that kicked off what is now my entire, my whole career really on thinking about the nature of engaged philosophy of science and fostering collaborations between philosophy of science and other researchers. Wonderful. I was, yeah, because I was going to say, you're right. I appreciate you uh, sort of completing a, a bit of the story in terms of studying philosophy of science and these ideas. But then, so even in your postdoc, you were kind of coming together and thinking about these ideas and, and, and bringing them all together in terms of what you wanted to do for the future. So now you're working. So you're at the center, or excuse me, your department, Department of Knowledge Integration. And it sounds like it's a fitting place for you. Yeah, it's perfect. I love it. Yeah, I love I it. <laughs> I feel so lucky. I, um, yeah. yeah. So it's, so I'm cross appointed to the Department of Philosophy. So I still don't, sure. you know, can yeah. you know, supervise graduate students, but we are an undergraduate only program at the University of Waterloo. And knowledge integration is basically a, um, an interdisciplinary degree where we teach students how to collaborate in diverse teams and across disciplines. So it's just such a great fit for me. Uh, uh, wonderful. And what in, in terms of being in a undergraduate only, pro- well, I, obviously you can both supervise graduate students or uh, PhD students if, you, uh, if, if possible, and also be connected. I imagine teaching philosophy. But is there anything that come that you found to be sort of a unique fit or uh, affordances that have been uh, uh, you know uh, given or permitted to you by being in this sort of integrated area? Yeah, absolutely, hundred percent. Um, so one of the biggest things is that I really like to do collaborative work and co-author. So most of my, the vast majority of my publications have been co-authored. Um, and so one of the affordances was that not only would they tolerate, (laughs) um, co-authorship and collaborative work, they kind of encouraged it. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So, um, so that was wonderful. I mean, already I was at the University of Waterloo where the philosophy department there, if folks aren't familiar with it, is already quite interdisciplinary, right. uh, very forward looking. Um, so I didn't really have to do much work to convince the, the folks there of yeah. the value of this work. They were really on board. Um, but, um, being knowledge integration meant that it, again, it wasn't just, it wasn't just that they made space for it, like they already do in the, in the philosophy department of Waterloo, but they really, they really expected it. Um, and the other piece was that because we're all housed in knowledge integration, so we're not in, you know, it's not like I'm in philosophy and then I just teach classes in knowledge integration. Right. I'm actually in a hallway sharing office, yes. you know, uh, sharing a hallway and having offices near my colleagues and the sort of the main that we've had sort of different folks involved in the program, but the four main faculty members we have right now is myself, a philosopher of science. Uh, another colleague of mine is an engineer who collaborates with artists and architects. Uh, another one is a somebody who studies the human dimensions of climate change, who herself has actually collaborated with Lisa Lloyd to look at oh. some work on uh, do work on scientific objectivity. Um, very cool. And then, uh, the fourth colleague of, uh, who I mentioned, uh, John McLeavy, who's been a collaborator of mine, is a sociologist of science and scientific knowledge. And so being there has made a huge difference because it's, it was the proximity and the conversations I was having with my colleagues and John in particular that led me down the path to, um, to sort of expand this work on socially relevant philosophy of science that I'd started with Carla Fair and others, um, to really start doing empirical investigations of this work. And so John's the one who trained me to do both qualitative and quantitative research methods so that I can conduct these surveys and interviews with previously philosophers of science, but now, as I mentioned, this on the past um, few months with scientists and engineers as well. So it's kind of a basic question, but what do you think these kind of systematic or qualitative uh, you know, empirical approaches 
of get you that you probably yeah. might not have gotten before, right? Like I, there's something and I haven't, I've reflected, I haven't reflected on it probably to the degree that you have, but like, I love engaging with other people and I feel like I can get so much from just a, a conversation or a, a, an engagement in this way. So I'm curious of like, yeah, what has that been like for you developing your methodology and what is mm. it? Yeah. What is it? Uh, what does it get you? Yeah. So I think that one of the things that gets us is the ability to empirically test the assumptions that we're making as philosophers of science. Yeah, and philosophers of science make assumptions all the time oh, that they don't the <laughs> actually interrogate, right? Yeah. Um, so, for example, when I was doing the work on social relevant philosophy science uh, and doing the, co- the we did the conference in Pasadena in 2008, this was the mini co- APA mini conference, mm-hmm. um, I saw a room of people with the folks I had mentioned already. So, you have Carla Fair, Helen Longineau, Nancy Cartwright as sort of more senior folks. Uh, Sandra Harding was there, uh, Robert Kreese, lots of different people um, were involved. And basically in the room, people were saying, no one values this work. No one in our field values this work. And at one point I stood up and I said, I see a lot of very powerful senior people in this room. How can we say no one values this work when all of us value this work? Can we just get together and value this work? (laughs) Um, And so that would be great. And so, um, you know, so I actually, Carl and I uh, worked with a number of other folks, um, Nancy Tawana at Penn State, Michael O'Rourke at Michigan State, and um, Kyle White, Sean Bias, and several other people were yep. involved in creating this uh, international research network on socially relevant philosophy of and in science and engineering. Um, and the idea was to really identify and pull together all the people doing this work. And so I think, um, you know, why I wanted to do the empirical work was I kept hearing these cl- empirical claims. No one values this work or this work is in the minority. No one is doing it. Uh, very few philosophers have collaborated with scientists or engineers, right? Or very few philosophers of science have collaborated with scientists and engineers. So those are the claims I hear. So that is that true? And mm. so between the survey and the interviews, I found out that actually a lot of the perceptions we had are not true. So for instance, in the, in the survey with philosophers of science, we found that over half of the respondents had co-authored with a scientist or engineer, which is quite a bit higher than we were expecting. Something like 80 to 90% said that engaged work was undervalued and should be more valued than it actually is. Um, and when we asked people about the barriers they experienced doing engaged work, we asked them both the actual barriers they experienced and the barriers they perceived were, pre- were present in the field for most people. And what we found was that for every single barrier we asked about, the perceived barrier was stronger than the actual barrier. Nice. And of course, there's ways to explain that. But I think part of the explanation is that people, that this sort of negative impression stick with people more strongly. So when they hear one story that someone had issues with career advancement because they were doing collaborative or engaged work, yeah. that looms large in their brain. And what we're finding now that we just did this um, survey with uh, the 2000 scientists and engineers in Canada and the US, so we're finding something very similar where, um, you know, we hear a lot of philosophers of science and scientists say that scientists have a pretty negative view towards philosophy of science Mm. or at best are indifferent. And it turns out that's not at all what our data is showing. Oh, that's wonderful. (laughs) I mean, I think that's really, it's so interesting to hear. And I've been definitely guilty of it of myself of just making these kinds of assumptions. And perhaps it's like what I hear from, you know, whatever, when you come into graduate school and you just hear some things or or you draw some inclusions from like a, an incomplete a, a source of data, basically just like a few interactions or one conference or something like that and you know or one journal submission uh, so it's really good to actually start to see what maybe on the whole or at least in a more broad view like these things there's actually some yeah there's some there's some positive aspects here or there's just some interesting findings that you would not have known that's that's wonderful. Well, and I'll just add one more thing to that, which oh, yeah. is that not only does it help us correct our misperceptions, but it helps us identify where the more promising interventions might lie. Mm. So, for example, I want, um, as car- part of my current project, which is the uh, five-year grant project on engaging uh, science with philosophy. Yes. As part of that project, not only are we doing these interviews and surveys, but the, the final part of the project is to do a, is to create a toolkit to help foster collaborations between scientists and philo- scientists and engineers on the one hand and philosophers of science on the other. Uh, um, you- and so by, yeah. And so by having data on what are the key barriers scientists experience, we know where we're going to be more likely to get 
uptake or have successful interventions. So, you know, for example, is it our, our, our people who are interested, is it that they're not interested in collaborating, right? Okay, that's one problem. Turns out that's not the case. In fact, I think something like three quarters of the survey uh, participants that we, um, that, uh, that we, the, sorry, three quarters of the people that we surveyed um, said that they thought that philosophy science was at least somewhat, if not highly beneficial to their own field which was surprising. And I think uh, 60% of respondents were interested in collaborating with philosophers of science. Another 10 almost had already done so. And so we knew that lack of interest wasn't the problem, but we asked about other barriers um, to identify what was kind of getting in the way so we knew what we could actually do about it. And stay tuned for that. So um, that's something where we're analyzing the data right now. I have some clues already, but I'll, Great. I'll let folks go and read the papers for themselves. Um, but it gives us an idea of exactly what we need to do for the, for the toolkit. So will the toolkit, do you foresee it being sort of like a, like a, a, a paper or a, a, maybe a manuscript, uh, a, a online website resource or something? Like, I guess maybe it could be a lot of things in terms of how it's disseminated, but I think I, yeah, I want to send this to people because I like, I would have loved <laughs> to have this when I was learning, when I was studying, or I would love to have it now just to like, you know, kind of further kind of have a sense because this stuff happens all the time. Like, again, I was just talking with uh, Charles Pence and he was like a few developmental biologists just approached me randomly to, to do a collaboration because oh, it happens. It's not like this thing where it's, and it's also not just philosophers of science approaching scientists where like, you're the one doing the lead generation and trying to sell them on this. Like, it's really the case that especially if you do good work and establish yourself, they're going to come, they may come to you or they may have some kind of thing where they, they are willing to, you know, engage and, and you could be of use and, and, uh, and help uh, with their project. So, yeah. Yeah. And that's what we found. We found that in a lot of cases, the scientists were approaching philosophers of science. Yeah. Another interesting thing we found in the interviews was that many of the interview participants were very adamant that it was crucial for the collaboration to be mutually beneficial. So they yes. did not just see philosophy of science as helping them. Mm. They wanted to make sure that the work that, that this collaboration was helping their philosopher scientist colleague. And especially if that colleague was a junior person, which sometimes was the case, they were very concerned about their career and making sure that this would, you know, not put them in a disadvantage, but that it would help their career. That was very heartening to see. And again, this is something where when I talk to philosopher science, they say, Oh, you know, well, scientists expect us to know the science, but they don't, they aren't interested in learning the philosophy. They want us to help them. You know, we're just in service. They don't really see it as mutually beneficial. It turns out the ones who collaborate, that's not true. Um, and even on the survey, one of the things we found was that, you know, scientists cited their own lack of knowledge of philosophy as a bigger barrier than philosophers' lack of interest or lack of knowledge of science. Again, quite surprising. Oh. So it's, it's not what you would, right? It's not what you would think. And so, um, so this is the kind of stuff. So for the toolkit, we will obviously have lots and lots of manuscripts from the data, right. from the survey and the interviews. Um, we'll also have some more like general um, report that will put things together where, you know, you don't have to sift through the literature review and everything <laughs> um, to get to the, to get the, to the juicy stuff. Um, but we're also envisioning a few other things. So for example, we want to share some of the tacit knowledge that people um, develop as a result of these collaborations and identify sort of some best practices or transferable practices for engaging these collaborations, for starting them and maintaining them, um, aimed at both philosophers and scientists, engineers, as well as people from other fields that might want to do this kind of work, these broad interdisciplinary collaborations. Um, and then we're also talking about, um, you know, you know, I've discussed this, since we can't share the interviews with folks because of the um, ethics, um, the, sort of the ethics agreement that we have with our institution to keep them confidential, uh, what are, one of our plans is that we've so far identified, I think, at least 100 cases of philosopher-scientist collaborations, mm. and we interviewed a subset of the scientists from that. Um, but what we want to do now is because we have that data we want to go back and ask who would be interested in doing a public interview where we're asking less sensitive questions. And we bring both of them together because between the interviews I've done with philosophers of science and the interviews I've done with scientists, there's already some teams that could bring together. And I know exactly what to ask. Um, and I know exactly what would be interesting to point out. So that way um, we're hoping that then it will give people an idea of these sort of origin stories and, and how these played out, but also we can maybe get the scientists to disseminate these to their own networks 
which will help raise awareness amongst other scientists and engineers that a philosophy exists and is a thing or sorry philosophy of science exists and is a thing everybody knows philosophy exists but a lot of scientists don't realize that there's this sort of subfield of philosophy of science um and that they will take a look at it and see um how their colleagues have benefited from engaging with philosophers of science in various ways well if this i i think this is really important work especially as for if if not only just for disseminating some of these again surprising findings it's going to i think it could really have a very strong impact on the future of how people approach these kinds of things because you're totally right when you initially started with saying like you know there's sometimes these kinds of interactions or engagements are discounted or seen as things that have like oh that's a side project maybe you can do that on the side or something like that and it's not encouraged as a means of sort of uh or just like the what it can provide, like in terms of like this can provide some sort of mutual benefit, you know, it's a mutual benefit to the philosophy. I, I just think it's really cool to see to see these things. So I'm really looking forward to this re- release of these kinds of ideas. So unfortunately, we're running it's a little bit short on time. So I think I actually have to jump uh, maybe so two final questions. The one happens to be, um, as I mentioned, some sort of side interests. I know some of us, some philosophers of science, we have our main research projects. Um, is there anything that you kind of do that's somewhat uh, tangential or just maybe sort of loosely connected to your research that you've been getting into these days? Yeah. So I do um, some research now on collaboration more generally, not just with philosophers and scientists. So as a result of teaching in the knowledge integration program, I've had to learn so that I could teach um, (laughs) frameworks for, for collaboration and really drawing from a lot of work in organizational behavior, um, organizational psychology. And so I have a whole research program that's emerging now where I'm looking at the concept of psychological safety in, um, in, in, collabor- in collaborations and teams um, and really how that also maps on to research a bit that we know about social diversity. So, for example, some of Helen Longino's work on the importance of social diversity in scientific communities. Um, so I've given a few talks there where I've looked at how that can actually, um, looking at that research and bringing it into philosophy of science can help us um, provide us with some frameworks for thinking about the mechanisms behind how these diverse perspectives could be taken up. Um, and then uh, conversely, bringing some work from philosophy and philosophy of science, like notions of epistemic injustice, into that psychological literature as well. Um, so, so that's one of my main projects. And then as I've been teaching these classes on collaboration, I've also started to study them. So I've been doing some work in the scholarship of teaching and learning to really identify, you know, um, how taking these courses on, I have a course, for example, called Making Collaboration Work. And I've been studying how it um, affects students' perceptions around the value of diversity uh, and the value of teamwork and their own experiences of psychological safety in their teams. And what's nice is that it turns out this does have some implications for my main research program with philosophers of science and scientists. Um, but it really has been a side project until now. Yeah. Well, team, I, I find team-based research to be fascinating. And uh, I, yeah, that's something we should chat about some other time. I'm, I'm really interested. I actually happened to take a dynamical systems class recently where there was a lot of, uh, a lot of team scientists in the class. And so getting to learn so about... Uh, yeah, so there's folks who do a lot of like three person team research. So I'll, maybe I'll put you in contact with those folks down at Arizona State. And so they do a human, there are human factors, like engineering students and, uh, research at teams. But like, so I'm not sure. I'm sure psychological safety is a concept that is probably involved. I haven't heard it yet, but I, I mean, but, uh, yeah, yeah, it's, it's, well, I'll just, I'll just say for folks who are interested in this real quick. If you are interested in things like team science, look up the international, uh, network for the science of team science insights a lot of great stuff there um and there's philosophers like michael o'rourke and steve crowley myself and others who've been really involved with that group oh fantastic okay well that's good to know that there's a group and then there's also philosophers that have sort of made their way into it which i think is really cool so all right last question uh that we ask our guests what do you take to be the greatest challenge facing philosophy of science today yeah um <laughs> I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna give two answers to that. So the short, the short answer is, I do think we have a PR problem. Um, I yeah. think that other, you know, other fields like uh, history of science and science education, sociology of science, you know, may have had a easier time uh, in terms of um, 
sort of making other people aware that they exist in a way that philosophy of science for lots of reasons, maybe partially historical reasons, hasn't. Mm. Uh, I think that's definitely changing. So that's really great. Um, but I think as part of that, connected to that is not only do we need to, I think, get the word out, uh, and we're hoping, you know, my colleagues and I are hoping that this research project that I mentioned on the toolkit will help do that. Um, but I also think we need to take a closer look at the incentive structures in academia. Mm-hmm. And I mean that both for philosophers of science and scientists and engineers, because when I did these interviews, everybody on, on both sides expressed a great deal of frustration at how these incentive structures made it challenging for them to do this yeah. work. And a lot, you know, and a lot of scientists and engineers said, you know, this is work that I think makes me a better scientist. Um, and unfortunately, in some cases, um, you know, it, it, it was challenging for them or their colleagues didn't actually um, value it in the same way that they thought they should. So I really would like to see those incentive structures change. And partly that's things like tenure and promotion guidelines, hiring guidelines, and that's something that my team is working on as well. Um, but partly it's a cult- cultural shift and an attitude shift. Um, and I think this goes back to the sort of PR issue as well. Okay. Well, thank you, Katie. I would, I would completely agree with you and I'd be definitely interested in, yeah, hearing some of the, I don't know, the shifts toward the positive program, but I'm looking forward to it. I think your toolkit is going to help for sure. I think that too, but, uh, yeah, but there's much. There's a lot of work to do, I imagine. So, <laughs> definitely. Uh, all right. Well, it was wonderful to chat. I would love to keep talking with you, but we have to have to come to a close. So, is there anything else you'd like to share or mention or plug before we go? Um, I think that's it. I just want to say thank you. I think it's wonderful that you're doing this podcast series. I think it's just such a great contribution to our field. I really appreciate that. Thank you so much. Have a great rest of your day, and look forward to chatting again soon. You too. Thanks, Nate. Bye, Katie. 